having me here. I'm Pradeep Ramachandran. I'm a principal engineer at Multicova. I'm here to talk about what remains, you know, a project that we've been going on for a long time. AV1 was the focus of the morning. So let's get back to the basics, talk about what we've been doing for quite a while. So here's an update on X265, what's happened over last year. So uh, the high-level agenda here is we'll go over the next. You know, what, what are the key items that we hit over the last 12 months? Specifically, over the 12 months, we have been focusing on improving support for 4K main tent HDR in various form and flavors. So, uh, particularly, we did AVX 512, and we got performance. And so I have my uh, key engineer here, who is actually the one who did a lot of the heavy lifting to talk about the AVX 512 work. We have done a specific targeted use case for ABR streaming, where we try to optimize the 4K stream when you're encoding for ABR streaming. We also have some improved uh, support for chunked encoding that I'll be talking about. And uh, we've seen that, you know, with the project having, I wouldn't call it maturing, and project having spent a considerable amount of time in open source, we're seeing an increasing footprint of X265 that we're seeing across both academia and industry. I want to spend at least a couple of minutes talking about that, and uh, I want to thank a lot of people who have helped us with that, and we'll go towards closing talks. So, here are updates over the last 12 months. Uh, our focus for the last 12 months was trying to improve support for 4K HDR with no loss to quality. I'm not talking about lossless encoding, I'm still talking about lossy encoding, but we wanted to make sure that you know, when you do 4K main 10 HDR, whatever flavor that you like, uh, HLG, Dolby Vision, HDR 10 plus, whatever, that X265 was making sure that you could go faster with the encoding with no loss to quality. Uh, specifically, though the focus was on 4K, there's lower resolutions, 1080p, Quad HD, Full HD, whatever version you want to say, automatically gets the benefit. Quality gains are always a goal. And I think as video codec engineers, if I say I'm not looking at quality, then I'm not a codec engineer anymore. And our focus has been specifically on perceptual metrics. Uh, we've looked at VMAF, we've looked at SIM Plus. So there's anybody in the audience who's from SIM Wave and wants to help me with some licenses for SIM Plus, I'm willing to take it. Uh, we've had three major releases over the last 12 months, version 2.67 and version 2.8. Specifically in version 2.7, uh, we had added support for HDR10+, Plus, and we'd actually taken a lot of pains to improve the compilation time of X265, which is something that not a lot of people pay attention to, especially if you're trying to deploy a constantly improving code base in your data center, in your cloud use case, whatever, compilation time starts to take a hit. And if you have many generations of SIMD, this really makes a very big impact. So we spent a lot of time to improve uh, compilation. We'll talk about more of the AVX512, etc. We supported HLG, as of May 2018, we are very close to supporting Dolby Vision, and that, with that, I think the whole loop of all HDR10 and its successors have actually been supported. We've been actively trying to improve our uh, community interactions through Doom9, through our blogs, etc. I talk a little bit towards uh, the end as well. So we are now five years young. Uh, we, our first commit that went into X265 was pushed in March 2013. And it's 2018, so this is uh, a part of the team that sits out of my office in Chennai. Many of them are still actively contributing to X265. Some of them are not so, are no longer with us, or are not directly working on X265. But we want to thank the continue. We want to thank, thank everyone for the continued support. This is just the team that's maintaining it. A lot of patches come from a lot of you guys. So thank you very much. And we look forward to more compressing years. They say 10 is the charm. So let's hope that we get there soon. So uh, the next bit that we'll talk about is how what our experience was with AVX512. For that, uh, I'm going to turn the stage over to Praveen. Hello, my name is Praveen. Uh, uh, AVX512 work was done by my team, so I will share my experience regarding this. So first thing uh, was the key challenge was to uh, not to lose any performance when we are doing AVX512. What the saturation of one socket? and put in and start instances to saturate the all dual socket and we have plotted the result. All results are over AVH2 version, so it is an employee to like comparing with C code. We already have the file x improvement over C code by up to the AVH2 optimization and these are on the top of those things.
Thanks, Praveen. I just want to add one additional data point to here. The right side graph that you see is actually real performance because if you look at how encoders evaluate sometimes the performance, they just run one encoding stream on the server and say that we got 25%. But really, in one server, if you're doing offline encode, you'll run two or three streams because you want to maximize utilization. And that increases load, increases temperature, affects frequency. And this actually is the performance improvement, including the entire load. So the system is running at about 90 plus percent utilization when you're actually measuring these, this data. So this is what you really see in a data center today if you took X265 and that. Okay, so, so much for uh, AVX 512. So it was fun work, it was hard work, but we got it to work, which we were welcomely surprised and we were happy. Um, let me talk next about trying to optimize encoding for ABR streaming. Let me check on time. So when you think about uh, encoding for ABR streaming, right, ABR set up to bitrate streaming, it is rarely the case that you're encoding only one resolution or only one bitrate. Most likely, you're trying to encode a typical ladder. Right? You have a 4K, you have a UHD, you have an HD, you have an SD, you have a Quad HD, you know, the whole slew. Right? You go all the way from you know, 4096 cross 2160 all the way down to something like 180p, so the whole loop, the whole way. So, However, though you're doing the stack, your rate limiter in terms of speed of encode is always your highest quality, your highest resolution encode. And the challenge that we were presented with, with was to say, can you do something about that? Right? And so the key idea that we came up with was to try and use reuse information from the low resolution to improve the speed of the high resolution. Let me say that again, right? It's inverse to what you would normally think. What we're trying to do is we take the low resolution analysis and we share it with the higher resolution and we try to improve speed. Now, if you do this, you are going to lose quality. That's what you're thinking. So what we do is in addition to reuse, we have a refinement to make sure that there's no impact to quality. And for this, we have two mechanisms. One is called a static refinement method, where for every frame, you just do the same algorithm. So it's very static, multiple levels. The natural progression was to move to a more dynamic system where we actually use machine learning. Um, I know you're thinking, hey, this guy's use, just using a buzzword. It's not. It really is doing machine learning on the CPU. I'm not talking about big fancy GPUs. It leverage machine learning on the CPU to actually get pretty remarkable performance, which I will show next. Hopefully you guys can see the text. So these are two measurements run on full length feature titles of Lucy and Loan. These are not your regular uh, JCTVC sequences. These are actually full length one and a half hour feature films. Right? And I'm showing you the performance of our dynamic refinement system, which is the machine learning framework, relative to the standalone. In terms of free speed, you can see it's over 2.4x, with less than 0.1 dB PSNR loss, and with perceptual metrics, which is where really we're trying to optimize. With SSIM Plus, you can see that it's less than one data point of SSIM Plus relative to what your standalone encode is. So which basically means that you are getting over 2x performance for your 4K, which automatically translates to an over 2x reduction in throughput, or 2x improvement in throughput, or 2x reduction in turnaround for your entire AB stack, ABR stack, because this is normally the performance limit. Okay. All right, so these were two methods to make sure that you got good performance for your highest long pole encode, which is your UHD at the highest bit rate with no loss in quality. AVX 512, literally free, there's really no loss. It's bit, it bit, it bit exact with our AVX 2 or our C version. Our uh, dynamic refinement, which is for ABR streaming, gives us very small quality loss, less than 0.1 dB, which is practically zero. Right? The third one was that we realized that a lot of our customers were using X265 in a mode of called chunk encoding. I'll explain what chunk encoding is in a couple, in one picture, if you're not sure what it is. But there is a problem with chunk encoding to keep it legal, right? So I'll also explain what the problem is. Now, since I don't have my PowerPoint up, the animation is kind of screwed over. But let me try to explain how I was trying to uh, talk about this. So in basic straight line X265, ignore the three parallel X265s that you're seeing as an overlay. You get uncompressed frames, you take one instance X265, straight line, get your compressed bits, and you stream it out. Straight and simple but it takes a long time. So a natural extension of what you try to do with this is that you try to do chunk encoding, where you split the incoming frames into multiple chunks, which can be one minute, 10 minute, one scene, whatever your chunk boundaries are, and you encode them in parallel instance of X265, and you stitch the encoded bit <coughs> and you stream it out. Simple enough, right? The 
benefit here is that all the all the methods that I spoke about earlier, both the methods I spoke about earlier, can be leveraged in each chunk encoder. Because each chunk encoder is like a 4K encoder, so I can leverage everything. But the problem with doing this is that when you stitch the bit streams together for each chunk, at the boundary, there is VBB. And so your uh, VBB buffer limitations that are existing at the boundary still need to be maintained. Which means that there needs to be some kind of communication from one chunk to the other to ensure that your VBB constraints are actually met at the boundary. And this was a challenge, and a lot of people were facing problems saying, at the boundary, I'm actually violating VBB. How do I deal with this? So we actually have added two independent mechanisms, which are different trade-off points between quality and performance to support this. The first is to specifically to specify the precise buffer occupancy that you expect at the start and the end of every chunk with two new options called VBB init and VBB end. Well, VBB init always existed in the rate of 264. We added a VBB end, which is now for 265. And the ideal algorithm is fairly straightforward. VBB init of chunk n plus 1 is equal to VBB end of chunk n. And that way you have, VBB, you have continuity in VBB. We also have some advanced parameters that actually enable you to control how many frames get affected before you reach VBB end because you don't want the impact of the VBB to be there in the entire video. Or rather, we wanted to let the users decide how much they wanted to be impacted. The other option that we have for this was what we call overlap rate control or segmented encoding with overlap rate control, where in addition to the exact chunk that each encoder is going to encode, we also send a few additional frames on both sides. So with this, what you can actually achieve is that from for each chunk, your encoder has the ability to look ahead both into the future so that your ending buffer limit, end buffer is actually accurate and also start look, start populating your VBB buffer from before the start of your chunk. And this way, without any additional parameters like VBB init or VBB end, we actually are able to get good VBB control without any loss in quality. So these two mechanisms are actually orthogonal to each other and they present different trade-off points in either quality or in performance. And these are obviously available in the public repo. I think these are already part of v2.8. If not, they will be part of v2.9. I'd encourage you guys to give it a spin and let me know what you think. So those were my three uh, big bullet items for 4K. I want to talk a little bit about improving the footprint of X265, right? The improving footprint of X265, rather. So X265 remains the most popular HEVC encoder till date. Thanks to support of all of you guys, it really helped us get here. There's been a lot of attempts by several other people to put out open source HEVC encoders, and I'm sure there will be others. But we've crossed the five-year mark, and we're excited to see where we can go from here. So that is, uh, I consider that you know a big thanks from me to from, to all of you in the community. We see that X265 is actively used by academics for publications and even in coursework. Right? Uh, in the publication. In, in publications, whenever we see that X265 is used in a publication, we actually ask the author to contact us <coughs> and write up about it and put it in our blog. So if you're listening to this and if you have a publication using X265, send us a quick word and you know we'll put it in our blog. Even we actively publish, we have a paper coming up in ICIP talking about the dynamic refinement. We talk about that in the blog as well. We also have seen that X265 is being used in a lot of coursework, especially not just in video encoding. People are using it for coursework in HPC in GPU computing, and uh, trying a lot of fancy stuff that I wouldn't dream of. And so that's turning out to be very interesting to talk to a lot of these guys. So if you are using X265 in your coursework, and if you want ideas, or if you just want to ping us and talk to us, you, know, you can always reach us and talk to us. We're always there. We're open to ideas. We're open to collaboration. And we're very open to criticism. And we are open source. We hear a lot of criticism. Right? Don't use foul language, but please, you know, reach out to us. Uh, our issue tracker is available on Bitbucket. We have Doom 9. We are active on IRC. Uh, and anything else that you can think of, reach me. If you want to send a raven my way, go ahead, please. Let's do that. Some closing thoughts. Uh, we believe that we have made, over the last year, particularly significant progress to further improving 4K main 10 HDR. Uh, in fact, the gap to AVC is closing. I'm not saying that it's zero. It's still our ways out. I think there was previous data showing that there was a 4x difference between AVC and HEVC for encode and decode. With a 2x gain, we are at about 2x the performance difference. Which is, we're getting there, right? I mean, you're not, you're not going to get a free lunch. You have to pay for it. You're paying less for it now with some of our changes. Uh, we continue to stay hungry and we stay foolish. 
Right? In fact, the one challenge that we have is somebody challenged us to improve a very slow, which has been the star, which has been the benchmark. Right? So we are trying to see if we can improve a very slow. We are receiving great <coughs> feedback from a lot of cloud deployments. A lot of guys using us on the cloud. As JB said, they don't pay us, but hey, it's fine. Such is life. Right? And we get a lot of feedback from them, so I really appreciate all the feedback. Keep it coming. We continue to look at great things in X265. Uh, a quick look into the crystal ball to see what's coming up in the very near future. Uh, HDR 10 Plus version 1, they have a slight change in spec, so we'll be supporting that. Support for Dolby Vision Profile uh, 5, 8.1, and 8.2 is coming up. We're looking at very slow plus quality. <coughs> have some ideas. If you have ideas, come and talk to me, right? It, it really is a long pull. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, we're looking at waste tune film anime. I saw some of the grain work that AV1 is doing, sounds pretty interesting. I'm, I'm trying to think of ways for that. We are progressing towards a V3.0 that, you know, in the words of Jonathan I should change everything. Right? We are looking at improving our very slow and resetting the benchmark that we had set with X365. And that should be pretty interesting and that should be coming up anytime before next video. That's about all I had, so I'm gonna leave the slide up. If you have any questions, I think we have quite a bit of time for questions if you have them. Really Questions? Uh, yeah, I'm um, sorry, for your AB, ABX512 slides, uh, you showed results on a Xeon Platinum, which is a very high end CPU. I think it's like $10,000 for each socket. Yes. Um, and the games were quite modest. Have you done any work on doing SKU detection? Uh, because different models throttle down at different rates. And if you think AVX 512 is worth it, whether you can pin that to particular calls to select certain calls throttle down as opposed to others. So it's, it's an interesting suggestion to see if I can pin AVX 512 to certain cores and let only those cores throttle down. Yeah. The challenge actually is that the way that X265 does RDO is that every thread of X265 that is capable of doing both frame parallelism and WPP is identical to everything else because everybody is going through the entire loop. Yeah. So trying to do, trying to let just one thread do AVX 512 and not let the other threads do AVX 512 is actually very difficult. And what ends up happening is the way that the frequency actually tips, if you look into the uh, spec sheet from Intel, is that when there's one core that enables AVX 512, a cluster of cores dip in frequency and not just that one core. So there's a lot of dependence there, and so we walked away from this. Right? We did think about this, but we walked away from this. But if you have ideas, I, I yeah, So it's just to follow on, if you don't mind. Um, have you done any work on the mid-range processors? Because because that's a, I, I must admit, I'm very envious of that processor you had. Like, it's, it costs more than a car, right? Like, <laughs> like but that's like on, on more more problem. reasonable down-to-earth processors that Joe Public can afford. Yes, um, yes, we have uh, the white paper that we have actually quoted does have data on a Skylake Gold 6148. Okay. that's closer to a million dollar yeah. CPU. It's yeah. not a high-end car. Uh, yeah, okay. the gains are very similar. Anything else, probably? Any other questions? No? Or just from the back? So, Let, let's get the microphone a bit over. I've heard a lot about the, the down clock for ABS high felt, and a lot of the information is very confusing, and it seems very conservative. Okay. Can, can you be a little more specific <laughs> with your question? Do you have you any idea what's going on? So the basic idea is very straightforward, right? You're triggering 2x the number of lanes compared to compared to those which bits. There is no free lunch. So even if you look at AVX2, there's an echo sound. Uh, even if you look at AVX2, right, when you turn on AVX2, there is a clock frequency reduction. Right? It's not just with AVX512. And the depending on the type of instruction of even AVX2 that you turn on, the clock frequency reduction might be higher or lower. Okay. So with AVX 512, it's the same game. You turn on AVX 512, the idea is that you're supposed to get 2x IPC. And if you're, as long as your reduction in clock is not 2x, for HPC, you will get performance. The reduction in clock, there is a reduction in clock. I don't know the exact numbers. There is a reduction. And yes, you are right. It's fairly cryptic. 
and that's why I'm not quoting a lot of numbers here. It's very cryptic. Depends on a lot of factors, which are internal to the CPU itself. Depends on the exact SKU. Depends on how many cores are active. Depends on which instruction you use. But bottom line is that it does have significant impact. But the <coughs> side of what we see is that initially AVX512 was thought was very exciting for HPC, but we're actually showing that it's also relevant for video encoding. And despite, you know, as you know, video encoders have a lot of SIMDable code, have a lot of code that's not SIMDable, especially on the encoder side. But even with that, we're actually showing that you can get the performance. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.